Well, we find ourselves today in the home stretch on the final leg of the book of Acts, chapter 28. If you have your Bible with you, you may want to turn there now to Acts chapter 28. We're covering verses 11 to 31. We're going to make our way through the passage this morning as it is laid out. If you are just uh, joining us or haven't been present with us for the last uh, 15 months or so that we've been in this book, then... Uh, for the sake of context, let me fill you in a little bit. This, Luke is the author of this book. He's telling now the story of how the Apostle Paul would get to the city of Rome. And Paul was in, at this point, Roman custody, on his way to stand before Caesar to answer charges, false charges, that were made against him by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. A portion of the trip was by sea, and the ship that he and his 275 traveling companions were sailing on had been shipwrecked off the coast of Malta. And by the mercy of God, everyone survived the wreck. But they had to spend the winter on the island, about three months among the Maltese people. And Paul used that time to minister greatly in the name of Christ, um, to heal many of their sicknesses and their diseases, so that when the weather turned nice enough to sail, the grateful people of Malta said goodbye and stocked up their new friends with provisions the castaways boarded an Alexandrian ship that would take them to Italy. From Malta, they put in to port at Syracuse on the southeastern coast of Sicily. From Syracuse, they sailed to Rigium on the tip of the boot of Italy. And from Rigium, they made land in Italy proper in the town of Puteoli. In Puteoli, Paul encountered fellow Christians, and he stayed with them for a week. When it became known that he was there, other brothers came to see him from the Forum of Appius and a place known as Three Taverns. And those names or locations don't really mean anything to us here on the coast of down East Maine, but if you might envision walking, say, from Columbia Falls to visit a friend in Ellsworth, you get the idea of the kind of commitment that was involved on the part of some of those travelers. So on seeing them, the Apostle Paul was heartened, he was encouraged, and understandably so. Ministry can be a difficult thing. There have been other times in Paul's life where he flat out wondered, perhaps he has labored in vain. One wonders often in Christian ministry if it's making a difference at all. It is easy to become discouraged, but here Paul is encouraged. Why is he encouraged? Because Christianity... That which he has given his life to, he finds it wherever he goes. He has not labored in vain at all. As we have noted previously, though he might be in chains, the gospel is not. The letter he penned to the Roman Christians some three years prior may very well have been producing fruit in that region ever since he sent it. Paul continues to take courage by the presence of fellow Christians, brothers and sisters meet him everywhere he goes. After seven days in Puteoli, the remaining journey would be overland on Roman highways, about a several days journey to get to the city of Rome. And though it did look at times as though Paul might not make it to that place, he does arrive. And that's not a surprise to us, is it? Because the Lord told him that he would go to Rome and stand before Caesar. The Lord told him that two and a half years, some two and a half years prior. God keeps his word. This theme of trustworthiness, that God can be trusted. It rises again and again in the book of Acts. And that's a good thing, don't you think? We can stand to be reminded of God's trustworthiness. If there's ever a place, it seems to me, in, in our following of the Lord that will trip us up, it is right there on that avenue of trust. We believe, and we can say that. Yes, we believe, but do we trust? Do we believe enough to place our lives in God's hand? So it is always good when we read the scripture and we see it again and again and again, God is trustworthy. 
God can be trusted. God keeps his promises. God keeps his word. One of the things I think we struggle with is that, yes, God keeps his word, but he doesn't always keep it in the time frame that we want him to. <laughs> Did you ever notice that about yourself, about your own life? Is it, yes, I trust the Lord, but you're kind of slow on the take here. But God's timing is perfect. He told Paul that he'd end up in Rome, and eventually Paul ends up in Rome. Along the way, some beautiful things happened that needed to happen in order to expand the kingdom in places it never would have reached before. Why? Because God is in control, because God is sovereign, because God is good, and because God can be trusted. His timing is always perfect. In verse 16, we read that while he was in Rome, Paul was allowed to stay in his own home in the company of a Roman guard. Whether he was literally chained to this guard or not, and it would have been many guards for sure coming and going. Nobody's going to live with Paul for all this time exclusively. But whether he's actually chained to this guard or not, we don't know. He could have been using that phrase that he said a few different times, I'm in chains. Figuratively, it could have been literal. We don't know, but what we can see here is that he's under some sort of house arrest. And it appears to be a pretty lenient form of house arrest. It doesn't look like his Roman captors are too concerned about the complaints that were made against him from a remote corner of their empire. Paul had not been in Rome very long before he called a meeting of the Jewish leaders in the city. Now I want to remind you that it had been the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem who were plotting to kill him. Do you remember that? It was the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem that wanted him dead. So he comes to Rome and, and within a few days he calls a meeting of who? The Jewish leaders there. Paul wants those Jewish leaders to understand his position. But more importantly, he wants them to understand the Savior. The fact that he had been mistreated by some Jews in Jerusalem does not stop him from trying to love the Jews in Rome. And instead of withdrawing from ministry, which one might expect after some of the hardships he has faced, he dives right in. He really is hardly moved in before he calls this meeting. And he's clearly not holding a judge against his, a grudge against his accusers. He says he has no charge to bring against his nation. They've brought one against him, but he has nothing to say about them. Indeed, he tells them it is for the hope of Israel that he is in custody. Paul sees the good hand of God in all of his circumstances, and we would do well to understand life the same way. It may not be exactly what we envision or what we want in the moment, but God's good hand, if you're a child of God, God's good hand is in it. Paul had that gift of being able to see God in his circumstances. He says it is not in vain that he is in chains. He is in chains and in custody for the hope of Israel. That's a phrase that would have sparked the interest of his Jewish hearers. That is a phrase they would have been familiar with. It's a term that comes from the writings of Jeremiah. The hope of Israel is the Messiah. And Paul's claim is that the Messiah has come. And he knows when he says that, I'm here for the hope of Israel, that they will be interested to know how that could be. His agenda, which is always his agenda, is to share the story of Jesus. Verse 21, and they said to him, we've received no letters from Judea about you. And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you, that you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Apparently the bad news about Paul, the false charges, hadn't made their way, at least not to the official Jewish channels, to Rome. Some surmise that once Paul left Jerusalem, the leaders there understood that there was such little credibility in what they had to say that they were not going to pursue it any further, expecting that he probably is going to stand before Caesar and then simply be released. So there's no sense to expend any more effort in the prosecution. What they really wanted to do, you remember those of you who've been through the story, was kill him. 
That's why they wanted to come back to Jerusalem so that they could kill him. When they couldn't do that, it seems like they may have just washed their hands of it because these guys in Rome are saying, we haven't heard anything bad about you. We have no letter. We have no information. Nothing that warns us about you. But we're interested to know what you have to say about this sect. This sect would be Christianity. About this sect of Christianity because everyone everywhere is speaking against it. So Paul's, Paul's reputation, ironically, seems to be intact while the church's is already being somewhat sullied. So on an appointed day, the Jewish leaders from Rome visit Paul at his place of residence. And verse 23 tells us this. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. From morning to evening. From morning to evening, they had church. I hear this and I think of Ezra reading from the law of Moses to the exiles who'd, who'd been allowed to return to Jerusalem. From early dawn to midday, they stood and he read from the law. I think of what the church was like back in the days of the Puritans. Pur Puritan preachers who were famous for two and three hour sermons. Oh. They would go on and on and on. One account, honestly, I read about this fellow who would put an hourglass on the pulpit. And when it was done, he said something to the effect of, you're all good fellows. Let's have another glass. <laughs> Two and three hours of preaching. Even Paul in Troas, you remember, spent a whole night preaching from midnight to dawn and here he teaches from morning to evening expounding on the meaning of the Old Testament scripture from the law and from the prophets which is just what Jesus did on the road to Emmaus remember that teaching about himself this was not a passionless lecture this was not when you think of that oh my gracious sakes alive two or three hours in, in church that's torture this was not that at all this was an emotion filled appeal that Paul made to people he didn't know and still loved because he knew they had to come to know Christ or they would be condemned. It lasted all day. You know what? You and I should expect that sharing the truth of Jesus so that it could be understood or received is going to take some time. I really sincerely doubt anyone's truly come into Jesus because of a meme or a, a sound bite or a tweet or a catchy saying even displayed on a digital sign. Sharing Christ well can take some time. A day, days, weeks, months, sometimes even years. Paul had to connect the dots here. He had to take the whole day. He had to trace the lines for them from the Old Testament to Jesus. You and I have different dots to connect. It's a similar work, but today we have different dots to connect in our culture. As we move deeper into a world losing its sense of sin and inside a country forsaking the traditions of its ancestors, it's going to be harder and harder to present the gospel in a, in a rational, logical, or meaningful way. We're going to actually have to provide people context for believing the gospel. In other words, it's going to take time because we now have to, for many people, go back to the very beginning. We have to lay out the framework for the gospel. The gospel makes no sense if you don't believe there's any such thing as sin. The gospel makes no sense if you don't believe in any such place as hell. We're going to have to go back and connect the dots in a way probably that generations haven't had to do in this country, if ever, certainly for a long, long time. It's going to take us some time to share the gospel. Can you share the gospel, friend? Could you? It's one of the reasons we ask about the gospel when we bring people into membership. Recognize that most people that are professing Christians 
know the gospel, understand the gospel, have received the gospel? Can you share the gospel? But if Jesus' great commission is for us to go and make disciples, how are we going to do that if we're not sharing the gospel? Please don't tell me that people are going to look at your life and say, so exemplary, I want to follow Jesus. I'm not saying that you don't live exemplary lives. I'm saying you have to use your words so they understand why you would live an exemplary life. Or how you could live an exemplary life. It is only through Christ. It is only through the holiest and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit that we can be set apart and live in such a way. So yes, we need to live in such a consistent way so that we have witness, but we also have to use our words. So can you share the gospel with somebody? Can you go back and use this little rubric, for instance, creation, fall, Christ response, right? There it is. There's four for you. Creation, God made a perfect world. Fall, sin came in and wrecked it. Christ, God sent his own son to come and rescue us from sin and from hell. Response, what are you going to do with that? How do you respond? See, it's not that difficult, is it? It's not that difficult, but that's the kind of connecting of the dots we're going to have to do. That's the kind of connecting of the dots I pray every member of the United Baptist Church is prepared to do. Eager to do, willing to do, ready to do. How do we make disciples? We make them by sharing the gospel. So not only do we have to have an experience for the gospel in our own lives, we should be prepared, ready, to give a defense for the hope that lies within us and to share it. We should do what Paul is doing right here in Rome, and that is patiently teaching those who will hear. That's what he's doing. Patiently teaching those who will hear. This afternoon, it will be my privilege to participate in the installation service of Clifton United Baptist Church's new pastor. And my role there is to give the charge. Between now and 2 o'clock, I need to figure out what that means. <laughs> Good luck. Go get them. I, I have a clue. I have a clue. I, I, hope to, I hope to use a passage from 2 Timothy 4, well-known words. Paul's giving this charge to his young friend, Timothy. And what does he say to him? He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repro reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and understanding and teaching. With complete patience. Yeah, that's our job too. It is the same. To do all these things, preaching the word and reproving and rebuking and exhorting, but doing it with patience. It does the church no good to, to mourn the loss of a Christian majority or to complain about the hostility toward our faith. We're not making any inroads when we go down that road. What are we supposed to do? Patiently teach. That's what Paul is doing. And, it, and to Timothy, he's only prescribing the very formula that he's been using throughout his own ministry, patient teaching. So we see in his teaching here in Acts that Paul was testifying about the kingdom of God, testifying about the kingdom of God. No surprise whatsoever there either that Paul is going to preach what his Lord preached. Mark 1.15, Jesus' first sermon that we have, right? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's a good sermon. And it's short. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom is at hand. Paul's preaching the kingdom of God. And of course, to preach the kingdom, you have to preach Jesus. You have to preach its king. The long-awaited Messiah, the Savior, the chosen one, the one greater than King David, the king of kings, has come to earth. His name is Jesus. So Paul testified to these Jewish leaders about the kingdom and he was trying to convince them about Jesus he's not passive about this notice he took the initiative for the meeting he is trying to convince them about Jesus he proclaimed and he and he cared about the kingdom because as we know and as commentator Tony Marita put it he cared about the king he cared about the king and he says we will have no passion for the kingdom if we don't have a passion for its ruler did you ever think about that, friend? One reason we may not be so passionate about the church is that we're not passionate about the head of the church. One reason we may not be so faithful in proclaiming the kingdom is because we're too busy building our own. 
But we are not citizens of this world, and we are not here to be building up our own kingdoms. We are here for one purpose, and that is to give God glory. We are saved for God's glory. That's what we're supposed to be doing, building his kingdom, trying to convince people about Jesus. Pray that we would have a passion for our ruler. Perhaps one reason for apathy in sharing Christ is that we really don't have a passion for our Lord. And I don't throw that out there as a criticism or to be uh, mean. There are times in our walk with Jesus that our eyes grow dry and our hearts go cold. It happens. But what do you do when that happens? You don't just get used to it. You don't just say, well, I guess this is my new normal, spiritual dryness. No, you chase after Jesus. You open that word, and you read about him, and more than anything, beloved, you plant your feet at the foot of the cross. And you look up and you view the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world, but beyond that, slain for your own. And you drink in all that that meant, that God himself thought not equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself for you. Tell me that won't help you to grow more passionate for your king or more in love with your Savior. That is what to do. Please, don't just settle for a life of spiritual dryness. Seek Jesus. Seek Jesus. And draw near day after day after day to that saving cross. Do we care for our king? I pray that we do. I pray that we always will. We must care for the king if there's going to be any unction whatsoever in our testifying about him. You know this, I know. We, we cannot expect to persuade others to bow their knees to Jesus if ours are not. Our knees must be bowed. Paul is bowed to Jesus sold out worshiper of Jesus Christ and as he preaches Christ he preaches the kingdom all day long and the result of that marathon Bible study was as one might expect as has always been throughout the study of this book mixed every time someone preaches the result is mixed it's not just going to be everybody in the room repents comes forward surrenders their life. Verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. The apostle had reasonable expectations, I'm sure, when it came to his preaching. To the Corinthian church, he, he said that he had become all things to all men so that by all means he might win some. All things to all men that by all means he might win some. Right? Jesus. It is said of Jesus. Mark 10, 45. The key verse in the Gospel of Mark. Not just that he, he came to serve but not be served, but to give his life a ransom for what? For many. For many. And John tells us in the first chapter of his Gospel, who is it that can become a child of God? Who will become a child of God? As many as would receive him. You know what that means? Many rejected him. The light came into the darkness, and the darkness knew it not. The darkness received it not. You want to be a child of God? You receive the light. You want to be among the saved? Of course you do. But Paul preaches, and he knows not everybody here is going to believe what I'm talking about. Not everyone is going to surrender his life. Not everyone is going to give herself up to Jesus after hearing even what Jesus has done. But some will. Some will. And that is why we preach and teach patiently. And some likely did on this day in Rome. Luke doesn't give us any specifics there. He said some believe, but we don't know the, the nature or the depth of their belief. But we can assume that some came to Christ through Paul's teaching then. But others were put off by his message, and they didn't believe. And there was one thing in particular that he said that was especially problematic to them. He quoted a passage from Isaiah. It's a, it's a passage that Jesus quotes as well uh, in the New Testament. 
about how the Holy Spirit was right when it said about the people of Israel, go to this people and say, you'll indeed hear but never understand. And you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. And turn and I would save them. That was offensive to them. Because after he said it, Paul presented to them its implications. Since the Jewish people would not believe and be saved. Salvation is given to the Gentiles. And unlike the Jewish people, Paul says, they will listen. Will you listen? Do you listen? They will listen, and they will be healed, and they will be saved. The Gentiles have been listening all along. This message of salvation that was coming to them, this was the greatest news ever that they had ever heard. They were listening all along. At the start of this Christian movement, you might remember, bringing the Gentiles in was kind of iffy. It was kind of like, are we supposed to be doing this? There was a lot of confusion in the early church about whether that was right or not. The apostles had to go and investigate and see what is happening here. The Gentiles even are believing in Jesus. But very soon it became clear this was the will of God. From of old, he has intended to bring people of every tribe, tongue, and nation into his eternal kingdom. This was how he was going to do it. Salvation is extended to the Gentiles. That was too much for the Jewish hardliners to accept. And that's unfortunate, but it's also to be expected. Not everyone believes when you put forth a gospel. Can you think of a more convincing, gentle, compelling, authoritative speaker than Jesus. And yet not everybody that Jesus encountered followed him. The Apostle Paul was a great speaker, but he does not convert everyone who gives him an audience. So, friend, don't be discouraged if you're not batting a thousand with your gospel sharing. Sometimes people reject what you have to say. Try not to take it as a rejection of yourself, but a rejection of the message that you bring. That is what's happening to Paul. People are not accepting him. However, just because they didn't welcome him doesn't mean that he wouldn't welcome them. And as we continue to read, we see in verse 30 that he lived in a, a rented home in Rome at his own expense for two whole years and welcomed all who came to him. And I can just see this revolving door of people coming to see the Apostle Paul. And believe me, if he was at the Grand, I would go to the show. And so wouldn't you. Can you imagine the privilege it was? This man is amazing. This man is a gifted teacher. And he just opens his home. You want to come talk to me? Come talk to me. It's a beautiful thing. Seekers, Jews, Gentiles, men, women, I'm sure children, all who wanted to hear him and spend time with him were welcomed by the Apostle Paul, who was consistently doing what? Verse 31, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And this guy is nothing if he isn't consistent. If you open the door a crack for the Apostle Paul, he's going to kick it in with the gospel. Any chance he gets, he is going to proclaim Jesus. And he does it with boldness and without hindrance. He preaches with all boldness. And I want you to know this isn't just a character trait. Some people are just more outright than others, more forthright than others. You might say some people are more bold than others just by, by virtue of their nature or their personality. This is not what is happening here. We're talking about the boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit. We have seen it on display throughout the book of Acts. Disciples fearlessly speaking truth to power. Remember when Peter and John were in an uh, incredibly intimidating situation. They were called on the carpet in the early days of the church. You read about in Acts chapter 4 for preaching Jesus. They were told not to. You can't, you can't do that anymore. Well, they gave an account of themselves. And in Acts 4.13 it says of the council members who were sort of bringing the accusations against them. Now when they saw the boldness 
of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized, get this, that they had been with Jesus. What the apostles demonstrated here, called boldness, was Holy Spirit produced courage. Luke tells us specifically about Peter's testifying in that encounter. He stood to answer the charges and how do we understand him? How is he qualified in the text? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Preached the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To a council of men who wanted to hear nothing of the sort. Never minced any words. You notice that about Peter in those first sermons. Remember we touched on that. You killed him. You crucified him. Doesn't he know they can kill him? It doesn't matter. Why? Because he's going to speak the truth. And he's going to do it boldly. How can a man do that? It is Holy Spirit produced courage. It takes boldness to preach the word in the face of opposition. It takes boldness to preach the word in the face of threat. And time and again, Acts 9, 28, 13, 46, 14, 3, 18, 26, 19, 8. Paul is caught in this text speaking boldly about the Lord. So here's, here's where us well-meaning preachers might say something like this. So brothers and sisters, pray for boldness in all your witnessing. Uh, that didn't seem to stir too many of you. <laughs> it's not a bad idea to pray for boldness in your witnessing. And most of us would admit, wouldn't we, that we are a little timid when it comes to sharing Christ. That we have actually dropped the ball on certain occasions when we could have said something and we didn't. So we have been fearful. So it's not a bad thing to pray for boldness. It's not a bad prayer, but I think it falls short of a prayer maybe we ought to pray. Lord, would you fill us with your spirit? You see, because boldness is a consequence. Boldness is a byproduct. Boldness is not the thing in and of itself. Boldness is what comes when you're full of the Holy Spirit. And, and however you want to put that, Lord, would you fill us with your Spirit? Lord, would you help us to walk by your Spirit? Paul says that. Walk by the Spirit. You won't fulfill the deeds of the flesh. Lord, would you help us not to grieve the Holy Spirit? Lord, we need your help not to quench the Holy Spirit. Any of the, however you want to put it, the Bible puts it all kinds of ways. But basically the bottom line is that we need more of the Spirit if we're going to be bold. We don't need to get out there and try harder. We need to be infused. We need to be filled. This is a prayer for Christians in America today. Amen? Not just, Lord, help us to be more bold. Because listen, boldness without the Spirit is obnoxious. It is. It, it, it feels like politics. It feels like manipulation. Boldness without the Spirit can be obnoxious, but boldness in the Spirit is confidence. And here's the confidence. We believe what we're telling you is true. We believe it. We know it is true. We are confident we would stake our lives on it. Pray, beloved, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you will be bold. So Paul preaches with boldness. And wrapping up now, it says unhindered. He continued to preach Jesus with boldness, unhindered or without hindrance. And what does that mean, without hindrance? Well, we could simply say this, that no one in Rome put any obstacle in his way. There were no stumbling blocks to anything that Paul wanted to, to say or do in Rome, as long as he stayed within the confines of his little lenient house arrest. That's what it could mean, that, that the word went out without hindrance. No soldier, no guard, no authority prohibited Paul from speaking freely and speaking openly about his Lord. But, and that could be true. And also, I think maybe Luke is ending this account with a reference to something that he has been making a point of all along. We've said it so many times that it may lose its profundity. It may lose its impact. But the word of God continued to go out from this little, here, from this little rented Ro house in Rome because nothing could stop it. Nothing 
could stop the word of God. Not then. Not now. Not now. The word of God will most definitely accomplish its work. It is, in fact, unstoppable. I want to conclude our service with a prayer this morning, um, a kingdom prayer. You talk about the word of God going forth, and the word of God continues to go forth. And there are people in this world who still have never heard the gospel, who do not know it. And we are privileged to partner in ministry with an organization, Wycliffe Associates, that is involved in Bible translation. One of our missionaries, Mark Hancock, just uh, went to Zambia. You can toss it. If you've got a picture or two, Matt, you can. There's, there's Mark working diligently in Zambia. Uh, do you even know where Zambia is? Somewhere in the middle of Africa? I don't know if we have any other pictures. There's the proof. That, there. <laughs> Look at all that technology in Zambia. So, the Word of God, is the, the going forth of the Word of God is not just a historical reality. It is a present and ongoing reality, and this church is part of it. Uh, and I think you should rejoice in that, but I also think and know how important it is that we pray for those who are involved in this work. So let me, let me close us out with a prayer. Father, we pray that you would help us to be encouraged by your perfect plans and your providential means by which you get your people where you want them to be and where you get your word spread throughout the world. We can easily be deceived, Lord, and discouraged into believing that the forces against us are prevailing. We hear story after story of opposition and hostility to you and your people in all corners of this globe. But your word in Acts reminds us you are greater than these hostilities and these powers. Evil may seek to chain your ambassadors, but it can never defeat the permeating power of your truth. Your people can be intimidated, imprisoned, even eradicated, but your gospel cannot, and it will not, until you return King Jesus. Let your glory fill the earth. Father, we rejoice in your faithfulness to see your word spread this morning. We especially want to pray for the recent work in Zambia. Father, we pray for the work that Mark Hancock and his Wycliffe Associates uh, co-workers were able to accomplish in that place. We praise you for Bible translation. We praise you for the use of technology to spread the truth. We ask, Lord, that the seeds that were sacrificially planted these past few weeks would take deep root, that they would result in much fruit, the savings of hundreds and thousands of people, we pray. And we pray for the dear ones who will hear your truth through their efforts and the brothers and sisters who will be bringing it to them in a language finally they understand. Lord, we rebuke the cunning strategies and the wiles of our enemy who wants to pluck the truth away. We ask you to show your power in this region of the world with a harvest of souls. Father, we pray for the many servants who offer their time and their talent to bring your word to Africa. We pray your blessing on them. Praying for their physical health, for their recovery from this long journey, rest after this tiring journey. And truly, Lord, a sense of satisfaction and a job well done in their labor of advancing your kingdom throughout the earth. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.